Right on. Right on. So I promise if you guys are interactive, if you, you know, keep the energy level in here, I'll get us out of here before 1.30. How's that sound? Yeah. And all the Christians said, I'm hungry. Uh, good times, good times. You know, it's always nerve-wracking when Pastor Tony asked me to speak. I think it's more nerve-wracking for him because he never knows what I'm going to say. But he's not here today, and maybe that's intentionally done. I don't know. But, <clears throat> you know, Pastor Tony and Naomi, they're doing a good job with this church, aren't they? They really are. You know, and when you're having your moments of prayers and stuff this week or, you know, just in your normal prayer schedule, I encourage you pray for your pastors. You know, because they need it. When they lead a church, they're on the front lines. And if anybody knows something about the front lines, you're the first one to take the hit. Right? So, you know, just make sure you keep them in their prayers. And uh, in your prayers, not their prayers. They pray for you, I hope. And, uh, you know, just we got to lift up our pastors. You know, put, their story kind of goes with what I'm talking about this morning. So, who here has ever made a plan for themselves in their life? If you have not... That's weird. <laughs> because at some point or another, we all make a plan for our lives, right? We plan something. We plan our careers out. We plan, you know, what we're going to have for dinner. We plan our spouse, hopefully. But we plan something. You know, we plan to come to church this morning. You know, when we post something on Facebook or Instagram, we plan what we're going to post. You know, one way or the other, we're, we're always planning. We as people, we continue to plan. How many here, or who here has never had a plan come to fruition? <laughs> the same amount of people. So the, some of you are doing really well, or we need to talk about goals. <clears throat> because I should have seen 100% of the hands up here this morning, which is about eight people. So when we plan something, it, always does, it doesn't always go the direction we want it to go, right? You know, sometimes in our careers... We get sidetracked or, you know, a door closes, another one opens. But it isn't always in what we want to do. You know, I, I'm sure at some point all of us have worked a job we don't want to be in. You know, it wasn't our goal, but we did what we had to do. Same thing with, you know, life goals. You know, places you want to travel, food you want to eat. You know, the, your spouse. You know, did you plan on marrying your spouse? And this is a good time for the men to say yes. Yes, I did. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah, especially if you're sitting next to your spouse today. <laughs> and if you're quietly in your head going, mm -mm, was it my plan? We'll pray for you. <laughs> Good luck. If you were to capture your life so far, we've all taken a selfie, except for the people who didn't make goals. I'm assuming they haven't taken a selfie yet. Dell's never taken a selfie. But let's be honest, when we take a selfie, we don't just post the first picture that we take, right? Without a filter, I should say. If you don't know what a filter is, talk to one of the younger people in here, because I'm still learning myself. It's something that makes the picture look better. But when we take that selfie that we want to put out there to the world, we're not putting the first photo we take, because let's be honest, three quarters of the photos that we take, we're like, oh, uh-uh, that's not happening. But that's the real version of us, right? That's the real version of us. You know, we're not always, what's that term, instified or, you know, I'm trying to be hipster right now. It's not working. No. Okay. We're, you know, we're not always filtered. We're not always as we appear on what we post, right? A lot of us will post things and, it'll look, and you know, other people look and go, oh, man, they've got it all together. But they don't know that that was just a second of the real picture. You know, but we choose for people to see what we want them to see. You know, Instagram, Facebook, all social media is like this. I don't ever see anybody unless it's a weird attention get seeking post. But nobody ever posts a picture of themselves at their worst of times. Because that's us. That's what we want. We want to keep that for ourselves because we always want people to have that image that I always look like this. And again, our spouses know the difference. Some of us got that. I, I will joke with you this morning. I like joking, mostly because I'm not comfortable public speaking. It really helps if you laugh, even if it's not funny. Again, I'll get us out of here on time. 
<clears throat> the laugh track wasn't working this morning. We try to control the outcome, right? We try to control what happens. We try to control, but at the end of the day, we don't really know what we're doing. That was a little early, but we don't really know what we're doing because we're trying to control an outcome that's not ours to control. You know, life isn't ours to control. We can control our actions. We can control how we interact with people. You can decide to be a good person or a bad person. You can decide to be productive or lazy, but you can't control what's gonna happen in five years from now. That's beyond your control. Some of us struggle with that. I struggle with that because I like to control. You know, I always used to make this phrase, I, I always seen the bigger picture. Yeah, and a couple people have got that here who I said it to all the time. They're like, I'm going home, let's pray, we're done. But it's true, there's always a bigger picture, right? There's a picture that we don't see. We are working as individuals in a society where there's much more happening than what's happening in our lives. And we don't always see. We don't always see the other side of what God's trying to do either. You know, this morning I want to talk about Paul. And just give me a second to get my notes here. But I want to talk about Paul because Paul, everybody knows the story of Paul, right? Paul was Saul, was a really bad dude, killed people in the church. All of a sudden God made him blind. Turns out he now is leading the new modern church the way we know churches today. A lot of roadblocks came up, was jailed, was beaten. You know, he has a pretty crazy story, and I'm sure he couldn't foresee all of it happening. But that's the background of Paul. So we're going to talk about Paul and Silas today. And we're going to go to Acts chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 6 to 40. And we're reading this from the Message Bible. So if you want to follow along on the screen or follow along, that's really small writing, so I'm going to go off my phone. I couldn't foresee me becoming blind later in life. That happened. All right, so I'm going to pronounce some of these words. They went to that place and then on the region and then on through the region of Galatia. Their plan was turn, to turn west into Asia province, but the Holy Spirit blocked that route. I mean, have you guys ever been blocked by the Holy Spirit? You ever feel like God's blocked you from doing something? Yeah, isn't that a good feeling? <laughs> um, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> when it turns out okay and when you see what the disaster you missed, it's a good feeling. So it, they went to, uh, their plan was to turn west into Asia province, but the Holy Spirit blocked that route. So they went to Messiah and tried to go north to Bethania, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them go there either. Proceeding on through Mysia, they went to Seaport Troas. Maybe they couldn't pronounce the names of the cities, and that's why they didn't go. Like, uh, no. <laughs> that night, Paul had a dream. A Macedonian stood on the, stood on the far shore and called across the sea. Come over to Macedonia and help us. The dream gave Paul his map. We went to work at once, getting things ready to cross over to Macedonia. All the pieces had come together. We knew now for sure that God had called us to preach in the good news to the Europeans. So in verses 6 to 8, you see that the Holy Spirit blocked Paul from heading east. God knew what he wanted to do. Paul had his own plan much like we have our own plans for things, but sometimes God throws a wrench into those plans and says, I got something else for you to do. But when do we know that it's God talking to us? You know, there's, there's always a question I have in the church or growing up when I used to see people come up and say, well, the word of God spoke to me and said, and I'm like, well, I've never heard this voice because I always expected as a kid, you have, you know, the roof would come off of my room and there would be a huge light and just big voice go, hey, get up. But that's not God, right? God comes to us in a lot of different ways. Sometimes God comes to us and sends us a message in friendship. Sometimes God sends us a message, you know, in church. Sometimes God sends us a message by putting a stop to, you know, the path that we're on. You know, we got to learn to hear God's voice. And the only way to learn to hear God's voice is by what? Reading the word. Thank you. Spending time with them. That's the only way you can nurture a relationship, right? You have kids, you don't get to know your kids by ignoring them. You know, you have a spouse, you don't get to know your spouse by ignoring them, do you? How many marriages in here have been successful because you ignore your spouse? Wes, put your hand down. 
you got to spend time, right? That's how you're going to learn the voice of God. It's not going to be, and maybe it will be, I don't see a burning bush happening in the front of your house. I don't see a donkey coming up to you and talking, although that would be a real trip. I think I'd actually like that one. You got to learn, you know, you got to learn to hear God's voice, right? And listen, if you right now are saying to your spouse, God's telling me to tell you something, we're going to pray about that too, okay? Because the spouses aren't always right, so I'm just kidding, they are. <clears throat> but in this case, God came to Paul in a dream, right? The Holy Spirit laid out where he wanted him to go. It wasn't with what Paul had wanted, but it's what the Holy Spirit wanted. God's seen the bigger picture. So putting out from the harbor at Troas, we made straight run for Samothrace. Okay. Uh, the next day we tied up at New City and we walked there to Philippi. Philippi? The main city in that part of Macedonia and even more importantly, a Roman colony. We lingered there for several days. On the Sabbath, we left the city and went down the river where we heard there was to be a prayer meeting. We took our place with the, woman, with the women who had gathered there and talked to one of them. One woman, Lydia, was from a place and a dealer in expensive textiles. Knowing to be a God-fearing woman, she listened with intensity to what was being said. The master gave her a trusting heart and she believed. So already, we've seen one salvation come out from you know, one decision to follow God. Sometimes turning left isn't right. That was good. Hey. After she was baptized, along with everyone in her household, she said in surge of hospitality, if you're confident that I am this with you and believe in the master truly, come with me and be my guest. We hesitated, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. You ever hesitated when somebody's invited you over? I do it every week. I like my quiet time. One day on our way to the place of prayer, a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic and with her fortune telling made a lot of money for the people who owned her. She started following Paul around, calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out. These men are working for the most high God. They are laying the road of salvation for you. She did this for a number of days until finally Paul got fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit that possessed her out in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And it was gone just like that. That's a gift. That is a gift. If you can have somebody annoying you and be able just to cast the stupidity out of them, that's a gift. Try it. You want to you know a good Christian family? You can see siblings casting things out from each other when they get annoyed. That's how you, that's how you, can, that's how you can tell a real Bible-based home, right? You see little Johnny running around, Sally, in Jesus' name, John. No? Okay, well... I recommend that next time somebody's talking to you and annoying you, just start casting demons out of them. Because they'll stop, right? They're going to stop talking because they're going to be like, what are you doing? There's a lot of knowledge in the Bible. Moving forward. When her owners saw that their lucrative little business was suddenly bankrupt, they went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up and dragged them into the market square. Then the police arrested them and pulled them into court with the accusation, these men are disturbing the peace. So right here, I think this is a little bit more than just what's going on in the city with the officials. This is a spiritual thing. This is definitely spiritual because these guys are doing what God's asked them to do. We have a woman who's possessed by a demon, who's fortune telling, who's now, the demon's been acknowledged, it's been cast out, and now the city officials are getting involved and saying, hey, we don't like what you're doing here. Do you think that's just purely on them, or do you think maybe the devil has just got his ruffles up, his feathers in a ruffle, right? What happens in your own life when you are on the right path? So many times, you know, over the years, I have tried to get my heart right with God, and I've backslidden, and tried to get my heart right and backslidden. When the devil doesn't like what you're doing, he's going to try to interfere. He's going to try to keep you under his control, right? That's how you know that you're on the right path. If, you are, if you're going in the same direction as the devil and you're not meeting him head on, you have to reevaluate what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, his job, his only interest is your soul for him. 
not for you to have a relationship with God. These men are disturbing the peace, dangerous Jewish agitators subverting our Roman law and order. By this time, the crowd had turned a restless mob out for blood. Do you see parallels to what's happening today? Look at our own society. The church is becoming less relevant. The government's taking more control to silence the church. Restless mobs. The quickest way to create disorder is a reckless mob. Anybody here ever been slandered on social media? That's good. Anybody here ever seen somebody get slandered on social media? How quick do the comments come in? How quickly do you see a post that somebody puts out and all of a sudden 15, 20, 30 people who don't even know that person is putting their opinions in? Read any newspaper article and you can see how quickly it goes from intelligent conversation to complete stupid rhetoric. That's a relentless mob. That's, that's, that's a relentless mob. And if you're partaking in that, are you glorifying God in that moment? There's, you know, I'm, I'm opinionated. If you hang out with me, you will know very quickly. And if you, even if you don't, I'm sure you've learned. I am a very opinionated person. But you have to have some wisdom behind your opinions. Does that mean my opinions are always right? No, not even close, but they're my opinions. But what, is, what am I producing from my own opinions? Am I just out slandering people? If I see a comment on something or I see a newspaper article that I don't agree with, <clears throat> like politics, I won't do that today. You're welcome. But if I see that, I have tons of opinions. But you've got to pick your battles. Are you going to become part of the mob mentality? Or are you going to, is your comments going to bring you know, glorification for God in it? Right? And I'm not saying if somebody posts something about the conservative liberals, you go, well, in Jesus' name, I say this. That's not what I mean. You're not going to win an argument that way. It'd be interesting to read, but you're not going to win an argument that way. But the best way for the devil to stir up havoc is to, what, create a mob. If you want to stir up havoc in your environment, you create a mob mentality. That's what happens here. That's what happens today. You, we have sensitive issues. We talk about relationships in the church. We talk about different things that at one time we as a society held as a moral standard and now we're being told that's the wrong way of thinking. And I do blame the church partially for this. I absolutely do. Because at some point for a long time the church went from a place of love and helping people to a place of persecution. And that's what we need to change. That was never Jesus' idea for the church. He never once wanted the church to become a place of persecution. Those doors, they're open. They're open. They're open for you. They're open for me. They're open for anybody that comes across and wants to walk into them. I don't care if somebody's wearing feathers as clothes and they come through those doors. Good for them to be in coming in here. You know, Pastor Tony's talked so much about people just coming in, the prostitutes, the murderers, stuff like that. But we are the ones who judge. Wisdom and judgment are two different things. I have the wisdom to be careful in those situations, but it's not my place to judge the person. It's not our place. But this is what we've done as a church. This is what we have done in, in, in the name of Jesus. We've created a mob mentality at some point. Maybe not us sitting in here. Or maybe we have. You know, that's between us and God. But at some point, the church has created a mob mentality. When the voice that we needed to be putting out there was love, we put out there was defensiveness. Jesus didn't get defensive. He never got, when he was up on that cross, he didn't go, you guys are really dumb right now. You have no idea what I'm about to do to you in three days. He didn't do that. What did he do? He prayed. He prayed. He prayed for his persecutors. He forgave his persecutors. He didn't generate a mob. I mean, Jesus had a following. But he didn't create an us versus them mentality. He didn't create that, that type of environment. He spoke against that type of stuff. It's amazing how many parallels we can see between stuff that happened 2,000 years ago to events that are still happening today. We just we look at things in a different, a different way. We have different technologies that it applies to. We have different social scenes. 
But one thing's true is they were persecuting the name of Jesus back then and they're still doing it today. The judges went along with the mob. Had Paul and Silas' clothes ripped off, ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to keep them under heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. He did just that, threw them into a maximum security cell in jail and clamped leg irons on them. Along about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing in robust hymns to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered, every door flew open, all the prisoners were loose. It's a pretty good deal. Startled from sleep, the jailer saw all the doors swinging loose on their hinges. Assuming that the prisoners had escaped, he pulled his sword and was about to do himself in. He's about to hurt himself, because he knew if all the prisoners had escaped under his custody, they were going to do it to him anyways. Figuring he was good as dead anyways when Paul stopped him. Don't do that. We are still here. Nobody's run away. Now, could Paul have escaped? God opened the door for him. He gave him the opportunity. gave him his out. But what did he do instead? He stayed where he was. Sometimes we have to stay in the season we're in for a while to fulfill what God wants us to do. And we all go through seasons. It happens, whether it happens when your school, you know, your workplace, your health, your marriage. We all go through seasons. Are seasons permanent? Do we live in winter every day here? Thank God. Could you imagine if we did? No. Seasons are only for a moment. Sometimes that moment takes a long time. When it's minus 30 outside and you've got to work outside, it's a long time. It might only be a couple hours, but you might as well be out there all day long. But it's only for a moment. And when you factor how much life we have, whether you're here for 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, 100 years, that five minutes in the scope of your life or that three months or that two years, does that seem like a lot when you put it into that context? But often we get discouraged during those seasons. Paul didn't get discouraged. Paul could have ran. He just got beat up, tortured, was thrown into jail naked. Did he have every reason to run? Would you run? I'd run. I'd be like, I'm out. This is stupid. I ain't doing that again. But he didn't. He stood, he stood where he was. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked them, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved, to really live? They said, put your entire trust in Master Jesus, then you'll live as you were meant to live, and everyone in your house included. They went on to spell out in detail the story of the Mass so the entire family got in on this part. They never did get to bed that night. The jailer made them feel at home, dressed their wounds, and then he couldn't wait till morning. He was baptized. He and everyone in his family. There in his home, he had, set, he had foot, so wow, food set out for a festive meal. I am going blind. It was a night to remember. He and his entire family had put their trust in God. Everyone in their house was in on the celebration. Do you remember when you got saved? Does everybody here remember when you got saved? It was, you know, that was, a, that was a pretty critical, critical, critical moment, crucial moment in your life. It's amazing how clear, and, you know, that memory can stay. At daybreak, the court's judges sent officers with the instructions, release the men. The jailer gave Paul the message. The judges sent word that you're free to go on your way. Congratulations, go in peace. You think God knew that Paul and Silas were going to end up in prison? He knew it was going to happen. Did he stop it from happening? Do we think that's fair? When you get sick, do you think it's fair? Do you think it's God? that's allowed you to get sick. Maybe he's allowed you to get sick. But is it fair? We don't think it's fair. When things happen to us, we don't think it's fair. No matter how bad your circumstances get, God's in control. No matter how bad. And no matter how hard, that's, that's hard to see sometimes. It really is. When things are happening to you, it's hard to see that God still has his hand in it. 
You know, there's often times you can stand, you know, in your prayer time and say, God, like, what's happening right now? Why is all this going on? And sometimes it feels like he's quiet for a moment while we're sitting there begging for our, our situation to be changed. It feels like God's absent. We've all had that feeling. And if you haven't that, had that feeling, I encourage you to start a ministry because that's very normal. In the darkest moment for Paul and Silas in that trip, even though he was directed by God, they still stayed in God's presence. They're beaten, they're naked, they're humiliated. And what are they doing in their cells? Are they complaining? They're not complaining. They're worshiping. They're still standing there praying and praising God. That's faith. Because I tell you, if I really hurt myself, it's hard for me just to sit there and praise God. That's hard for anybody to do. Verse 27. We put that back up for a second. So in verse 27, 28, the jailer, thinking that he was about to get persecuted for letting everybody escape, Paul and Silas could have very easily attacked that guy. Not because he put them in jail specifically, but because he was part of the system that did. Often as people, our initial response to those who we deem are part of something that's hurting us is to what? We lash out. Right? We want to retaliate. We're angry. We're frustrated. But they didn't do that with him. They could have let him kill himself. It would have made it much easier for them to escape. But he didn't. They show compassion on him. You know, they had grace. They were following with the Holy Spirit. They knew, they trusted that they were in that situation for a purpose. They had already seen Lydia and her household get saved. They had an opportunity to minister. When's the last time you ministered to somebody who's persecuting you? That's hard. It is hard. When you're in your moments, how do you handle it? Do you have compassion? When you're going through a hard time, are you compassionate on those around you or do you let bitterness take over? It's, all, it's easy, it is super easy when you're going through something, whether it's you know, financial issues, marital issues, your health issues, it's easy to let that become bitterness, isn't it? We've all done it, we've all done it. We start looking for excuses on why it's happening, we start looking for reasons or people to blame or sometimes those people who are just simply trying to reach out to us, we snap at them. Not because they're the ones that did it, it's just because we want them to understand how we're feeling. I don't want help right now. I don't need anybody else. I can do this on my own. I can fix my own problem. I can heal myself. I don't need your help. We've all said that at some point or another. I don't need your help. What's wrong with asking for it? There's nothing wrong with asking for it. Let me ask you a question. Dell. if Sharon needed help, would you help her? Sure would. Sharon, you do the same thing. I don't think anybody in this house today would say that they would turn a blind eye to the person sitting next to them, especially for family. The person sitting next to them, I don't think you'd turn a blind eye if you saw them in need, would you? Even if it's something as simple as let me pray for you. If it's a hug, if it's just a word of encouragement, we need that. We need that connection as people. We need that compassion. We can't let bitterness take over our lives because what's going to happen when you become bitter? Are you going to get better? Has any time your anger or bitterness made your situation better? Ever. It usually makes it worse because not only is your back sore, but you're acting like a jerk too. So now... Your back's sore and you're a jerk. That sucks, especially for those around you. Or, you know, you lost your job and you're letting everybody else around you pay for it because you're just, you're being bitter. Oh, they're stupid. You know what, I didn't want to work there anyways. Well, then if you didn't want to work there, why are you so angry? Because we want to blame somebody. We want that reason. 
Teenagers are great for this. Yeah, I got caught doing it, but they started it. Did you do it? Yeah, but only once. Don't matter. Well, if I wasn't hanging out with them, you said it. If you weren't hanging out with them. It's easy to let those emotions take over. You know what it is hard to do? It's hard to be positive in a bad situation. You get diagnosed with cancer, you're not going to throw a party. Maybe you do. I probably would throw a party. I'd be like, woohoo! Sucks. <laughs> but a good reason to have pizza. I actually don't like pizza, so. Good reason to have something. But you're not going to. You lose your job, you're not going to go throw a party. You go through a divorce, well, maybe you'll go through a party if you throw a divorce. I don't know. That might be your situation. Sometimes, I mean, that's warranted. Congratulations, you're free. Not that we want divorce, so. But you don't. You're not going to throw a party. You know, marriage breakups, relationship breakups, it's usually a lot of hostility. It's usually a lot of blame. Well, they did this. She did that. He said this. You know, she hit me with a frying pan. Like, I'm, maybe I'm testifying now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could hope for the frying pan. We have to have compassion in those seasons. The only thing that's going to get us through that season is what? Compassion, love, faith. That's the only three things that are going to get you through those seasons. And relationship. Community is built with strength in numbers. You can't always, you can't build a house by yourself. You can, if you're Sam, but it's going to take you a long time and you're probably going to hurt your ankle doing it. But, but there's strength in numbers. You build community in numbers. Community is made to support each other, right? Paul and Silas didn't take the offensive with their persecutors. They turned it into community. Lydia's household found salvation. The guard's household found salvation. And who knows what other generations preceding or following them are going to have salvation because of their choice not to be bitter in that moment. God may not always heal your situation, and he never promised that your situation is going to be easy, but he promised it's going to be done with him. Paul chose to head west instead of east, which was his obedience. So what's God telling you in your season? What's he telling you right now? When's the last time you actually sat in your situation and got on your knees and prayed and said, hey, what do you want me to do with this? What am I supposed to do? Why am I going through this? Why are we going through this? What's happening right now? We have the Holy Spirit. We have the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what God's plan is. And it may not happen in a second. You may or may not get a dream that night telling you not to go this way, but to go with this way. But at some point, God is going to reach out and speak to you. It may happen in a few months, but just stay in his presence. When Paul was obedient and went west, and I'm going to close with this. When Paul was obedient and when he went west, Paul didn't see his decision leading him to being beaten and jailed, but he chose to keep his heart right. And when Paul was beaten and jailed, he didn't expect God to create an earthquake and open the doors. When he became free, he didn't expect his obedience of staying where he was to save the guard's life and bring salvation to the guard's house. These were all choices from one decision of being obedient. One choice has already led to all of this. We can't predict the outcome of what's going to happen. We have to learn to be okay with not being in control. You have to learn to be a passenger sometimes. I do not do well as a passenger. I will tell you that right now. I do not do well either when I'm the driver and I have my passenger telling me when to brake and when not to brake. There's nobody in here, especially, I'll see the, I see the women laughing because they're looking at their husbands like, yeah, my brake works better than yours. <laughs> but it's true though. There's nobody in this room who likes to have your passenger tell you how to drive. And if you do, you should become a bus driver. 
how do you think it makes God feel when we're continually trying to tell him how to drive? You're talking about the man who created, created this, who created us, created this church, created this world, this universe. Where's our place to tell him how to do his job? It's not. That'd be like your kids coming up to you and telling you how to parent. <laughs> That's not going to go over too well, is it? You shouldn't ground me. Yeah? Good luck. Yeah, they can try. They try all the time. But we do the same thing with God, right? God, you need to heal me. Do I? What are you going to learn from that? What are you going to learn from it? We want the safety of the cross, but we're not always satisfied with the cross. I'm going to say that again. We want the safety of Jesus, but we're not always satisfied with him. Because if we were satisfied with Jesus, we wouldn't question our situations. We would trust his hand. We would trust his, his wisdom. We would trust the Holy Spirit. It's, it's really easy to put our hands up and say, I do surrender, but it's really hard to actually follow through and surrender. It is. The other thing Paul didn't see in his season was he was in the process of creating the church as we know it today. Imagine if he had went the other way. How different would our story potentially be? God might have found somebody else to do it, but Paul did it out of obedience. I'm going to actually close because I see some people are getting a little tired in here. So, We just got to learn to trust. We got to learn to give up that sense of control that doesn't just apply to us in our spiritual walk, that applies to us in everyday life. We want to control things. We want to control our experiences. We want to control the, the outcome. We can't. You got to be content with sometimes just letting things happen. Does it suck if you get sick? Sure does. Are you going to change it by being upset about it? Now, expressing your concerns is a little bit different. You're going to have a season of being sad, and that's okay. But you can't stay there. It's like when you become saved. We screwed up before we met Christ, and we're going to screw up after we met Jesus. It's okay to not be perfect, but it's not okay to stay in the same rut you're in. Are you truly saved at that point? If you continue to do the things you did prior to saying that you're a believer, without repenting, without changing your attitude, without changing your actions... Are you really saved? Do you really have Jesus in your heart? It's really easy to stand up in church and say, I'm going to heaven. But the Bible didn't say it was easy to get there. When Jesus never promised he would make the path easy. He would make the path clear. He would show you the expectation. He would give us the grace. He would give us the tools to get there. But he never said we were all going to get there. And I think that's one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves in church is that just because we sit here 52 days a year that we're going to heaven for it. That's not the case. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. No different than being bitter doesn't change the situation. You've got to rely on one person, and that's Jesus. That's it. I encourage you this week when you come up against trials or, you know, when you have things going on or maybe even right now when you've got stuff going on, I encourage you to just look at your perspective. Change your perspective on it. This perspective really does make a huge difference. You can have one bad situation. You can have a glass break. You can either be upset about that glass breaking or you can be happy you didn't cut yourself. It's all about your perspective. I want to finish with a song and then I promise we'll get out. It's before 1.30 so you should be happy. But when we, go, we come to Christ, we're not coming with him with a little bit of us, are we? No. We're coming with him with what? With everything we are. You know, and there's one song that I love. I absolutely love this song. And I encourage you to stand, to soak for the last few minutes of church here in his presence and if, I mean, if you've got something burdening you, you've got 
situation going on in your marriage or in your health or your work, there's no shame in coming up and kneeling at the altar and letting God handle it. Like I said, it might not be an easy road, but it's going to be a road he's going to take you down. Let's play that song.